Welcome to our third Westmeath County Council Decade of Centenaries podcast, supported by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gwaeltacht, Sport and Media. The title of this episode is Eileen McGrain, Kiluka Native and Revolutionary Insider. It focuses on a relatively unknown but nonetheless significant Westmeath connection to the heart of the Irish War of Independence. Eileen McCarvel, born Eileen McGrain, a distinguished academic married to the Monaghan-born revolutionary and later TD, Dr. Patrick McCarville, was born at Riverstown Lodge, Kilucan, on the 9th of August, 1894. She went to school locally, and like another renowned revolutionary woman, Dr. Ada English, studied at Loretto College, Mullingar. After her life was touched by tragedy in her mid-teens, Eileen won a scholarship to UCD, where her career in revolutionary politics began, eventually placing her as a key member of the intelligence community run by Michael Collins, whom Eileen served as private secretary. Telling us about Eileen's career is Marika McCarville, who is the youngest granddaughter of Eileen and Patrick McCarville. Marika, who works with Enterprise Ireland in the fields of international PR and communications, started to take a more in-depth look into her grandmother's revolutionary activities in recent years. Presenting some of her findings here, Marika underlines how Eileen is one of Westmead's strongest connections to the Irish independence struggle after 1916. So Marika, recently we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the the truce uh, and the cessation of hostilities between the IRA and uh, Crown forces. Could you maybe explain for us uh, where your grandmother, Eileen McGrain, was this time 100 years ago and how she ended up there? 100 years ago today, my, my grandmother, Eileen McCarve on name McGrain, was imprisoned in Waltham Prison in Liverpool. Um, she'd been court-martialed and sentenced to four years servitude, penal servitude, and uh, her court-martial took place earlier this year, 100 years ago, on the 25th of May, so she was she was court martialed uh, for her role in the IRA. She had been um, captain of the UCD branch of Common Amon and a member of the executive committee. But at the same time, Eileen was also Michael Collins's private secretary, and she managed the uh, hub for IRA intelligence from her flat at Ten Dawson Street in Dublin. Um, that flat had been raided on New Year's Eve, nineteen twenty, by fifteen members of the auxiliary uh, forces and uh, a huge amount of uh, IRA intelligence, guns and ammunition had been found uh, there. Uh, Eileen was sent originally to Mount Joy Prison, but after the court martial, she was, she was sent to, to Liverpool. Um, I got access to the, the British Home Office records, which reported on the decision to intern Eileen in Liverpool. I'll just read those out. Um, the records state, This lady, Eileen, acted as Michael Collins' private secretary and the documents found with her related to the whole organisation of the Irish Republican Army. Miss McGrain occupies a very high post in the Common Amon, a proclaimed organisation. The sentence inflicted was, under the circumstances, an extremely lenient one. She was deported from Mountjoy to an English convict prison as plans had been discovered to effect her escape from Mountjoy. So I think given the, the severity of, 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 uh, of, of the crime uh, as that the, the British saw, I mean, she could have been charged with high treason, which, you know, which was punishable by death. So they did consider it a quite a lenient sentence uh, of four years. And at that time, with the truce coming on, uh, there was an understanding that they, they didn't want to cause uh, further upset um in those negotiations and so she she under the circumstances she was quite lucky and that she did just get four years um a sentence of four years now uh marika eileen of course is a westmead woman um i i had heard about eileen before i i knew something about her her uh work with michael collins i didn't know she was originally from westmead until I came across a report in the Westmead Examiner around the time of her trial, which uh, described her as a as a Kalukan native. Uh, could you maybe uh, go into her her early life and her background and explain to us her her ties to uh, Westmead? Sure. Well, Eileen was born in Kalukan County, Westmead. She was born uh, to Dr. John and Annie McGrain. 
So uh, John was the local GP at the time, um, and but unfortunately he died in 1911 when Eileen was 16. So he he died of the black flu or TB, as it, it was it was known. And her her mother Annie died six uh, six months later. So I I understand they had no other relatives in in Ireland. Um, I did see on a, on a, on the 1911 census that she did have a grandmother, but I think at the time of their the parents' death. Uh, the grandmother, I think, uh, passed away at the time. So they were effectively left um, as orphans. So Eileen had, um, an um, she was the eldest of, um, she had four other sisters, uh, siblings. Um, so there was John, Christopher, uh, Mary, and then the youngest child, Millie. So as uh, John, Christopher, and Mary, the middle children, uh, went to New Zealand. So they emigrated to New Zealand and um, Eileen as the eldest and Millie the youngest, uh, Eileen was 16 and Millie was just six. They stayed on in, in Westmead. They, uh, they were uh, pupils of the Loreto Convent in Mullingar. Um, so Eileen graduated from, from Loreto and she achieved a scholarship to go to UCD. And Millie also uh, graduated from Loreto Convent with a diploma in piano and went on to be a piano teacher. So that's really my the, the information I have around her, her connection to, to Westmead. Um, really from there, she, she moved to Dublin where she uh, studied English at UCD, the National University, uh, then known as the National University. She graduated from there. Um, with a degree in 1917, and she took up a, up a position with UCD um, as, a, as a lecturer. And at the same time, she became deeply involved in, in the War of Independence and, and the Civil War. Okay, now, of course, as you said, when she went to UCD, she became heavily involved with coming them on. Um, I, I've seen a reference to... Uh, the fact that she, uh, from from an early stage, she had advocated for the transformation of coming them on into a more efficient and explicitly military unit, um, maybe uh, less of an auxiliary unit and more of playing more of an active role. How did she? Uh, how did Eileen fare in this respect? So from reading her common Amman statement, it's clear that she had an interest in bridging an alignment with the IRA. And at the common Amman annual convention in 1919, she proposed to reorganize common Amman. And in her own words, that was to make it a, a more efficient military unit to meet enemy hostility. Um, Eileen said that the proposal was well received by the younger delegates who showed a desire for the reorganization and the vote was carried by a large majority. To further facilitate cooperation between the IRA and coming on, Eileen said, I was one of the movers in getting in touch with the headquarters of the IRA. I would say from that time, we were very associated with them in, her, in, in our work. Then, of course, she, she uh, started to work closely with Michael Collins, and we have that uh, in the piece you've done for RTE, there's that uh, quote, um, from, from Joseph McKenna describing her as uh, one of the one of the most efficient women uh, working working closely alongside Collins on, on the intelligence front. Um, can you can you take it maybe from the beginning there of her, her involvement with Collins and, and where it went? So um Eileen held an unusual position because um, while she was officially very associated with Common Amon and she was had a, held a very senior role within Common Amon on the executive director as director of publicity, and also she, she had advocated for the establishment of the UCD branch of, of Common Amon, unofficially she also worked with, with Michael Collins. And this was, as I understand it, quite unusual because when women took up, took up roles you know, working with Sinn Féin um, and, and the IRA, that they usually disbanded their role with coming Amon because they didn't want to have that visibility. But um, Eileen, I understand, is quite unique in that, in that she, she carried out the, the, the dual roles. Um, so according to Eileen, she said, when the national reorganization began in 1917, I became acquainted with General Collins. I was a student in University uh, College Dublin and had joined the military forces to be trained to take part in the fight for independence. I always think the language that my grandmother uses is very interesting in terms of 
you know, she really uh, saw her part in the role of the women as they were part of the, the military, even if that was on an unofficial basis, they were part of a, of a, a fighting military at the time. Um, she said on Collins' instructions, she queried large sums of money and gold to the, for the Department of Finance and accompanied Collins on visits, visits to Mrs. de Valera when Eamon was in America. Um, this, this was the, the start of, of their association together, but um, Eileen would deepen her association with um, Michael Collins. Um, she took on the role as being his private secretary and the room at the center of her flat at, um, at 21 Dawson Street for two years became a hub of, for IRA intelligence. Um, so she, she was in daily contact with, with, with Collins um, throughout that period and, and others like Gurley O'Malley and Harry Boland that, who were utilizing um, and in and out of her flat um, all, all of the time. There, there was also a strong publicity element to her, her role, uh, Marika. Um, and it, it's funny that you've gone on, as her granddaughter, you've gone on to work in, in publicity yourself with, at an international level with, with Enterprise Ireland. Um, can you maybe fill us in uh, more detail on that, on, on her work for uh, on the publicity front? Yeah, so I was really interested in, while researching my grandmother to find out that she was director of, of publicity at the time for Common and Mom, but also um, also carried out publicity work um, under the direction of, of Michael Collins as well. And uh, given that I work in that area, I work for Enterprise Ireland and communications manager for Ireland and international. Um, it, it was interesting that we had that, that commonality. Um, you know, Eileen said uh, she was director of publicity for Common Amon. and she, she, she also said that on direction of Michael Collins, I was to give my attention to further publicity efforts as um, the IRA feared the British coercion might undermine the resistance of the Irish populace. That's to, that's to, uh, to quote her. But in that role, she said that she met many foreign journalists and um, uh, distinguished foreigners, as she described them. Uh, distinguished people that came from uh, from America, uh, England, and uh, also the the Pope sent his envoy as well. Um, so there was there was a lot of um, people who were you know sympathisers internationally who were coming to Ireland to get a better understanding of what was happening and um, you know how how issues could be solved. And um, my grandmother um, very often met these distinguished foreigners and and foreign journalists. To communicate what was what was happening at the time and to make the case for Ireland and to get international support for Ireland. Um, you know, I think it's it's really important to note that there were sympathizers uh, you know, in England at the time for, for what was happening. Um, it's it's an area that I think is, is often overlooked. And she she did um mention at one stage that she may she met the sister of Lord Henry Cavendish Bentick. And indeed, when my grandmother was interned in Liverpool. Um, Lord um, Henry Cavendish Bentick wrote a letter to the Home Secretary, a doctor, uh, Mr. Edward Short at the time, you know, really uh, uh, to, to, to make, uh, to highlight just the, the issue around uh, Eileen's sentence in Liverpool. And he said, to quote the letter, he said, I hope you would agree with me that the sentence in the circumstances is a very savage one. So, you know, there were sympathizers and um, that was a role that she carried out in terms of meeting those people. And trying to influence them. Okay, and as I said already, um, you know, her uh, January nineteen twenty one came. She was arrested, and her trial was was covered extensively in the Westmead Examiner, given her local connections. Um, what as a leader, how how did she come to the fore at this time? As as uh, you know, as uh, among the prisoners who were in Mount Joy at the time. Uh, what sort of a leader was she and uh, how, uh, as uh, following on from that, how much trouble did she cause for uh, uh, the, the British and the prison governors at the time? So, yeah, to, to, to summarise, I suppose, her, her, her time in, in prison. Um, 
So she was initially, at, once she was arrested um, at her flat on, on New Year's Eve, uh, she was interrogated in, in Dublin Castle and then was sent to, to Mount Joy. So as a senior member of Common Amon, while she was in uh, uh, Mount Joy, she was the commandant. So she was the head of the women political prisoners in Mount Joy at the time. She spent, she was there for five months. Um, she was waiting for her court martial. It was a very excessive amount of time. Um, to, they really delayed her court martial. I mean, the reason for the delay, the excessive delay, was because it was so sensitive. The documents that were captured at her uh, flat at 21 Dawson Street, they were so sensitive. So they were really trying to weigh up how do we deal with this and, you know, looking at, at, the, the, at the time of the truce, etc. cetera. So, um, so there had been, Michael Collins was absolutely scathing um, that she was in Mount Joy. Um, he uh, he or tried to orchestrate her uh, and her escape from Mount Joy. So for that reason, uh, the British government decided that she would she would spend uh, her penal servitude would be in in Liverpool. So she 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 was there until the tenth of August. So from May until the tenth of August, and then she was returned. This was part of the truce negotiations. She was returned from Liverpool to Mount Joy, and that was at the special request of of Sinn Fein that she gets returned to Mount Joy. Now in Mount Joy, there was the very infamous uh, escape of political prisoners, which was led by Linda Kearns, and um, Eileen did not sanction. Um, this escape that that she she they she knew about it and she did not uh, sanction it. Um, as a result, there were some serious consequences for the rest of the political prisoners, women political prisoners in Mount Joy, and um, they they became they were placed under the guard of the auxiliaries uh, twenty four seven. Um, so it was it, as a response, they went on hunger strike. Um, the women political prisoners went on hunger stri strike. Um, uh, and the, the British decided that they wanted to remove Eileen, uh, given that circumstances, back to Liverpool and uh, were going to great efforts to, to, to remove her, you know, and it was potentially, you know, as a stretcher case to, to remove her. Um, and uh, I think there was, you know, some, some major quarrelsome, you know, between um, Eileen and, and the wardens at that time um, because of the hunger strike, because of the issue with the auxiliaries uh, putting them under, under guard, under watch. Um, so there was, it, it, it sounded like it was a very, very fraught time. At the same time, the British were trying to remove um, Eileen um, from Mount Joy and back into Liverpool. So, Marika, we've talked about uh, Eileen's um, uh, close working relationship with Michael Collins over the, the two years of the War of Independence. How, what, what direction did she take after she emerged from, from prison and when the Civil War came about? It's a, it's a surprising one, given, given the, uh, the depth of her, her relationship with Collins. So absolutely, I mean, given her her close association uh, with, with with Collins, um, it was really just, uh, surprising to find that she took the anti treaty side. I mean, she's been described as you know a, a confidant of of Collins, and you know they had a close working relationship for a number of years. So I was very personally very surprised that she took the anti uh, treaty side. So I, Eileen, in describing her role um, in the Civil War, she said, you know, some months before the outbreak of the Irish Civil War, she resumed active service for um, headquarters at Oglop Naharan, which is the anti-treaty IRA. Um, she said she carried guns to Dock on, on a few occasions. And, and throughout the, the Civil War, she was in constant touch with the IRA headquarters and, and General Liam, Liam Lynch. And, and it was during that time that she had, uh, you know, meetings with the, the Poit, Pope's envoy um, uh, and, and various other foreign media and, and um, uh, distinguished foreigners uh, looking to establish what, what was happening in Ireland. I mean, given the islands closest to Collins, uh, you know, very, very surprised. And I really tried to do some research to really understand, you know, what her thinking was at the time, just to understand better, understand her ideals and very much her coming to Mon statement, you know, uh, led me to have my own understanding. It's obviously an interpretation, but um, sitting in her in, uh, Islands Coming to Mon statement, she, she highlights that she was hoping that there would be reconciliation between both sides. In her statement, Eileen extensively covers the shooting of Harry Boland. And I thought this was particularly interesting. She said, as Harry had been active 
trying to bring a reconciliation between the two sides and had been meeting Mick Collins um, for that end, we felt that his death, which seemed to be purposely brought about to prevent reconciliation, put an end to, her, her, to our hopes. So while she was anti-treaty side, you know, she was very much, you know, in, in favour of a reconciliation between the, the two. Um, she really put a lot in her coming amongst on Harry Boland's uh, funeral, she she had a she had a, a leading role in that funeral. Um, she said um, Sheila Humphreys, who who had been the, the the vice captain of the UCG branch, she said Sheila Humphreys and I were in charge and walked at the head of the cortege to Glasnevin. There were several bands playing the Dead March on the route. It was solemn and sad and left on me an unforgettable impression. This was aggravated by the fact that at the top of Parnell Square, standing in the shadow of the pillar box outside number 15, was the British officer who had acted as prosecutor at my court martial in the North Dublin Union in May 1921. He was in Mufti. The counter left me with a sinister feeling, and it was in keeping with our conviction that the British were strongly at the back of the civil strife that had shattered our boasted national unity. So I think those two quotes from her common demand statement are are very much uh, reflective of of you know her 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 rationale her thinking I think around um, uh, civil war politics and though she took the anti treaty side she was very much in favour of reconciliation and felt that the British were very much at the underbelly of that civil war and and causing that divide. Um, so, of course, Marika, uh, Eileen went on to a very distinguished career in academia um, and then over the years, uh, you know, for example, through her statement to the Bureau of Military History and her application to the Army Pensions Board, she had the chance to reflect on her military service between, between 1916 and 1923. Uh, did, did, I, I know you were uh, five or six when she died. Did, did she talk much to your father, let's say, about the events of those years over the years, or indeed did your, your grandfather talk about it? And what, you know, when looking at, looking at their uh, military uh, service pension applications, what did you learn from those documents that, that was new that you hadn't, hadn't read before? Yeah. So I'm the youngest granddaughter of um, Eileen McCarville. She died uh, when I was five or six. So I have very faint, scant memories of her. But one thing is, when I was growing up, I always had an understanding. It was always discussed at a very top level it, that um, she had been um, Michael Collins' private secretary and that she was the first woman to be court martialed in Ireland. So that was my understanding growing up. But it's really only in this year that I decided to do a lot of research into her role. And I wanted to piece together the, the full picture because the reality is it just hadn't been discussed. And I don't think Eileen discussed it much with her, with her children, um, with, my, with my father and, and um, uncles and, and aunts growing up. I suppose we have to understand that in those post-war war years, things were very uh, sensitive in Ireland. You know, people had difficulties getting jobs, etc., depending on what side they were on. So it really, in those post-war years, the stories, in a sense, got buried. Uh, so in the centenary year, for me and for my family and for others that are interested in the story, I wanted to piece together an understanding of her role and, you know, have searched through various, you know, the Come in the Mon um, statements, her military pension application, and many books that have been written on the era. She's referenced in so many books, but I kind of felt that there wasn't one place to, it hadn't been brought, the story hadn't been brought together in one place. And I, I wanted to attempt to do that, to try and piece together her an understanding of her role. And you know, she had a very senior role within Common Amman and, and the IRA. And um, so um, it, it has been very enlightening to, to find that out and to, to piece all of that together. And of course, part of your piecing it together uh, involves a Twitter account, I believe. Yeah, so I, I decided I was looking to see what format to, to share this, this information that I was gathering. I decided on, on Twitter, it's not a platform that everybody uses, but I thought that I would be able to, you know, as information, as I found information that I would just start to share it on Twitter and start to piece together, you know, kind of mini chapters looking at 
various different elements from from her early years to um, the War of Independence, uh, her her work with Common Amon with with Michael Collins and um, the Civil War, just to kind of piece it together into into mini chapters to try and pull all of that together. I think you know, in the it is it is disappointing that my grandmother didn't write a, a memoir that she didn't document those those year those years. You know, potentially it's it was just they were they were you know it happened and and they kind of you know mo moved on and also that things were very very sensitive at the time. Um, I mean, she went on to have a very uh, you know interesting, very big life. She was um, a lecturer in UCD. Um, really had a life in academia. She was also an author. author. Um, she was a big supporter of, of Irish artists such as um, E.B. Home and Mamie Jellett and Jack B. Yates. Um, and she also served uh, 30 years on the Cultural Relations Committee, which was uh, set up at the time by Sean McBride, who was then Minister for External Affairs. So, you know, she continued her service to Ireland right through her life. Uh, sitting on, on that committee. Uh, she went on in, in, the, in the 60s, went to the Sorbonne in Paris to, to do a doctorate. Uh, so she went on and accomplished a lot. She had a very uh, accomplished and, and big life. My grandmother Eileen um, married another prominent Republican and politician and medic. Um, and that was my grandfather, um, Dr. Patrick McCarville. They met through uh, their association with Common Amon. So um, one of the tasks that, that Eileen had was uh, on the medical training for the Common Amon um, uh, members. And actually my grandfather was the doctor who was giving them the training. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, kind of how to deal with wounds and bandages, et cetera. And my grandmother was also involved in, in that medical training uh, facility. So I, I'm presuming that is where they met. I don't have uh, an exact details, but I'm presuming that's, that's the crossover that I found between them in those early years. Um, my grandfather also got a scholarship to go to UCD where he studied medicine. So again, I suppose they, they crossed over in, in UCD at the time as well. And, you know, nice that they were both uh, uh, had scholarships there. So they did marry in 1925. Um, and yeah, they were they were courting all through the, the War of Independence and, and Civil War years. They both spent a lot of time in, in prison. And we have some you know, fantastic letters uh, between them uh, from those those prison days. Um, so uh, so, you know, they're essentially a collection of, of love letters, you know, between them. Um, unfortunately, they're not particularly politically um, uh, insightful through just at the time they you know anything that was uh, redacted and, and crossed out if it, if it was and it, it was just unsafe to put anything of, of, of great significance or politically uh, significant into those letters but uh, that's how they met yeah love also blossomed during those war of independence years and uh, during the, the years of war and um, and they they married um and uh, yeah lived together and they had a house in Fitzwilliam Square where they lived yeah, with their family. I suppose in, in considering uh, Eileen, you know, it, it is appropriate to, to, uh, to reference the obituaries that were written um, on her death in, in 1984. Um, the Sunday Press said that Eileen never lost sight of the United Ireland and its own language. And the Irish Times said at her home in Fitzwilliam Square, she was a welcoming hostess and her lists of guests regarded no political or religious divisions. And most significantly, and of Michael Collins, the Irish Times reported, she looked back nostalgically to the years before the split and kept only the kindest of memories from many who found themselves on opposing sides. And I think that really nicely sums up just her view of the, the Civil War years and um, that she kept only the kindest of memories for those that found themselves on the opposing side.